This is lecture six of the Mundak Upanishad and the very last lecture of this series. Today we will complete the Mundak Upanishad. It's a very important lecture. There are some lovely verses, very profound verses that we will read and try to integrate into our lives. In the last session, we discussed some practical matters and I mentioned that just theoretical discussion is not enough. We need to practice and we had a very interesting discussion at the end where I said in any area of life, to be successful, one needs to put an effort. And I referred to a study which was done in the area of music and athletics that it requires around 10,000 hours of practice to be really good, to be really an expert in that field. Taking that idea into account, if we were to use that here, in yogic sadhana, in our daily practice, we would also need time and effort to integrate these ideas in our lives as well as to purify our minds and prepare ourselves for the higher teachings, higher secret teachings. Secret, not because we don't want you to know something, but secret because you need to reach a certain stage in your development before you can understand these matters. Just as a child says, I'm in class one, but I want to go and study that what my friend is studying in class four. Well, that's not possible. You need to go step by step. And we talked about it in detail, that it's important to have a daily practice. Verse 4 expands a little bit on this idea of sadhana, the important criteria for yogic sadhana. Verse 4 says, this Atman cannot be attained by those who lack inner strength, sincerity, tapas or dispassion. However, one who is endowed with these, with these means attains self-realization and as a result enters the realm of Brahman. This verse puts it in a negative way. If you do not have these qualities, you cannot attain Atman. What this means is, you need to have the qualities of inner strength, sincerity, tapas and dispassion. What is inner strength? We also call it Sankalp. Sankalp Shakti is the first Shakti that you need. The strength, the determination that you want to do something, you will do something. I mentioned that for any field, when you want success in any aspect of life, you have to put effort. So, also here, to put in effort, you need a certain determination, that inner strength, the will, the desire to do this. And that is what is meant here, to have that determination. If you don't have that determination, then it's very difficult to do it, to do anything, right, for that matter. 
If you're not really interested in something, you're not going to be successful in that area. A complete lack of interest. And these are related. Inner strength comes with deeper interest, desire, willpower. All these are different ways of expressing the same idea, Sankalp Shakti. Sincerity is required. If you're not really sincere, some people say they want to do something but are not really interested or not really sincere about it. Generally, the sincerity of the person shows an action. When people say, yes, I'm very interested in something, I really want to do it. But they don't do anything. They don't follow up the words with action. That's a clear sign that there is a conflict. One part of the mind says, yes, you should do this, you want to do it, this is good for you. These ideas may come from the external world. Somebody says, do yoga, it's good for you. Learn meditation, it's good for you. And so you feel you have to do it, you should do it. But somewhere deep inside, you are not utterly convinced about it. Or you are not quite interested. You find it boring to sit and listen to these spiritual talks. You find it boring to sit and do what you consider nothing. And such a person finds himself in a conflict. So words and actions must match up. They don't match. There's a conflict. Creates tension in the system. And we create more problems for ourselves. We create more difficulties in our lives. So sincerity is also related to authenticity. To being authentic and honest to yourself. When you really do want to do something... You have made up your mind. You will put in effort. That effort is known as tapas. The word tapas comes from fire, tapa, heat. And tapa, the heat generated from these austerities, from effort. This is karma. This is action. Now it is really boiled down not to talks, not to intellectual ideas, not to... Not to You know, just lip service, yes, yes, I want to do, but actual action. That means something is manifesting in the external world in the form of action. You are actually sitting down four times a day, even if it's only for a couple of minutes. Then there's a sudden heat generated, power is generated in the system. This is the power of karma. When there's an action, there has to be a reaction. So when you create this karma, there are impressions, samskaras, and the samskaras lead to karma again. So something is beginning to shift, move, and transform in your life. In the beginning, it could be simple. You come in contact with a teacher, you meet spiritual or like-minded people, you acquire a new perspective to life, you begin to see things differently. You have different kind of companionship suddenly that you keep uh, contact with. So this already creates a difference in your life. Some of you know the story of Valmiki. He was a thief and a murderer. And 
he came in contact with the sage who then was able to convince him to leave that path that evil path and take to meditation to transform himself so this is an example of somebody who left that evil way and suddenly there were new things happening in his life completely different from his old life different action led to company of different people so now he was keeping the company of his teacher his teachers students different ideas were coming into his life his whole life if you imagine how it must have been before as a murderer and a thief now is completely transformed imagine the kind of thoughts he has the company of people he is keeping the ideas that he has so this is a complete transformation and that can only happen when there is some action if you have thought about valmiki when he was a murderer and a thief perhaps he was thinking oh i should stop doing these evil things but the thought remained the thought it was not put into action so as long as you don't put that good thought into action it is of no use it's only when these good thoughts are manifested that there is a big shift and change and transformation in our life the last point mentioned is dispassion vairagya vairagya does not mean lack of emotion sometimes dispassion it sounds boring you know? sounds emotionless sounds like you have really no feelings that is not meant by dispassion vairagya is very dynamic it's very lively vibrant it is not emotionlessness you experience emotions and the power of emotions can be channelized can be guided in a way that is useful until eventually you become a kind of a witness you are able to let go of things and you don't get caught up in negative emotions which pull you down drag you down trouble you create play havoc in your mind and life vairagya means you are able to see things the way they are and that's very important to have if you see the order in which this has been mentioned it says in a strength or sankalp sincerity tapas and vairagya it is given in this order very often people think oh vairagya means i'm supposed to be indifferent dispassionate and they try to be indifferent they try to be detached that is not really possible that is a very contrived attempt to be dispassionate either you are dispassionate or you're not vairagya is a state of a witness it is not something you can try to imitate it's not something you mimic copy or oh, let me look at how my teacher behaves and i will behave like him then you are not a yogi you are just an imitation so yogis are not imitations they are very authentic and they remain true to themselves 
to imitate somebody, even if it happens to be a great master or a great saint, is nothing but imitation. And that which is an imitation cannot be truth, cannot lead you to truth. So the order is important. First, cultivate inner strength. Have the strength also to be authentic, to remove your conflicts, which will immediately surface. The moment you decide to do something, you will find obstacles coming your way. You must be aware of that. You may have observed this in your life. The day you decided, I want to work hard and do well in my exams. I want to achieve something in my life, so I have to study and I want to do well in my exam. The moment you took that decision, your friend calls you and say, Oh, shall we go out? Let's have some fun. Let's meet. Let's catch up. And there goes your resolution. I'm sure that most of us have experienced this in some form or the other. Inner strength is cultivated by sticking to this idea, not just, you know, letting it all flow away. If you have decided you're going to study hard and not just enjoy all the time with your friends, then you should also stick to that. And this can be challenging. Sometimes you need even support. You need support of your family. You need support even of your friends. The same is true here. You need maybe support of your family, your friends. If you have made a resolution to meditate four times a day, if it's only for a few minutes, then you ask for support and you get the support of people. Mostly it's done simply by explaining what you're doing. In my experience, when you share things with people, you explain to them what you're doing, they are generally very cooperative, helpful and supportive. If you are using your meditation time to escape work, to escape your problems, to run away from your family or friends, then you are only going to create more conflicts in your life. So, developing the inner strength is something that you will do day after day after day. It doesn't end, really. It's an ongoing process. The process continues through removing the conflicts in your mind. The doubts which creep up, the lack of action, which shows that there's something which is still disturbing, pulling you down, removal of these conflicts through brutal self-honesty is required. It's an ongoing process. Remember, there's no time plan for these things. Tapas is then the action. You're starting to perform your action, your meditation, your practice, whether it is twice a day, four times a day, even if it's for a few minutes every day, you're doing something. And this practice, it is this that leads to Vairagya. This will lead to Vairagya, not merely intellectual reading or, or pretending to be detached. So, we must learn to distinguish between pretense and the actual thing. 
Vairagya is not something we can imitate. So this is an excellent verse which actually sums up the entire process in just a couple of lines. And so one who has these qualities has all the means required to attain self-realization and enter the realm of Brahman, become or be identified, be one with the universal self. So these are the qualities required. It's a long and ongoing process to cultivate them and sustain them. It's not something you do and then, okay, it's done. We tend to think in terms of goals most of the time and say, okay, this is done now, check off the list, you know, that's done, next thing done. This journey is a little bit different. It's not about, oh, I went to this place, I saw it and I'm done. It's happening every day, day after day. So that requires a great deal of inner strength, sincerity to keep you going. As I mentioned, for anything in life, for success in anything in life, you need to have that. that to sustain, a sustained effort is required. All right. So, questions on this? Comments? Radhika Ji? Yes. I don't know if it's really like a question, so more of a comment, just that what you were sharing about the dispassion mm -hmm. um, is helpful because it's um, it's really challenging. It's kind of like the, it's if you're pretending like you don't care sort mm -hmm. of a thing, mm -hmm. and then it just, then inevitably it, it leads to more trouble, <laughs> and uh, but you don't recognize it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, times uh, when that happens um, and so are you saying you know uh, that if we're just if we can just focus on those other qualities initially this other thing it can just come like that and even if we find ourselves pretending not to care when we do and this kind of thing just to let let that be and you know trust that in time it will resolve itself Yes, I mean, pretending is not, not really a good idea, right? It's not authentic. It's not, uh, it's, it's, it's not being true to yourself. Pretense is, is basically like putting on a mask, pretending not to care or pretending, it's okay, I know I'm okay with that, that's fine. You know, that doesn't quite ring true, and you know it yourself. And What do you do? You don't do anything. You just be honest. You simply say, yes, I'm hurt about something. If somebody says something mean to you and say, yes, I'm hurt about it. Maybe you can't do anything about it, but be true to yourself. And it's not easy to do. I know that. I'm, uh, this, this takes years of experience to have that kind of authenticity, to be that authentic. And, and, to pull it off, but not in a harsh way. You know, yeah. you can be authentic, but can be very rude and, and nasty and hurt people. And that's not what I'm saying. Be authentic, right. Right. but yeah. find the balance on how to communicate this with people. You know, it's like music. Uh, there's a very nice saying in German which says, it's, you know, it's the tones which, which make the music. It's how, you know, you play the music, you play it high, you play it low, you, you know, it's, it's so much more, you have to be so sensitive, right, in music. So that's what is required. 
to be sensitive to yourself as well as to others. To be authentic means, really it means to be present. And it does take a lot of effort. And yes, you will make mistakes. Initially, you may sound harsh. People will say, hey, you know, how can you talk to me like this? Or you, you end up trying to be nice uh, when actually you should have just said it. <laughs> and so these are life experiences that one gathers. But what we need to know is ultimately what we are feeling and then how to communicate that skillfully. When you... So and my question, I guess, then, is can we trust that this that, that process through which we gain... Because I feel like what has happened is we can read this instruction or that instruction, but actually it, it just if we can... I don't know if... It, by trusting in this process, can we trust that this, this, the dispassion can come on its own, you know? Like, I'm not saying um, without the effort of sitting and doing the meditation, I, but that's how it's working in these order, that in this order that uh, you have put forth. Yeah, that has been One. put forth by the sages and has worked for thousands of years. And so we say, follow the path of the sages. That's the shortcut. So you have two options. To trust, as you said, to trust that these words are, you know, saying the truth. They come, there's a certain wisdom behind them. And then for that you need some trust. Or you continue to experiment <laughs> and find out the hard way. <laughs> and that's what happens uh, most often. That people find out the hard way that... Um, you know, that this does really work. Yes. Finally, people um, who have experimented with things themselves come to realize that there is a certain wisdom in the words of the sages. And that's the highway, you know, that's the fast way, the shortcut. And it may be a bit difficult initially, but it really is the shortcut. Well, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, that was a nice question, you know, because it was somehow kind of reflecting the question of um, every person in a way. Uh, these are the doubts that, for example, Arjuna expresses in the Bhagavad Gita in the first chapter. He wanted to just give up. He didn't want to fight the battle of life. He didn't trust initially the words of Sri Krishna. And he said, you know, I am just not going to fight. <laughs> I, this is not right somehow, you know. And it takes a lot of convincing from Sri Krishna who says every now and then stand up and fight, stand up and fight, you are a warrior and that's the inner battle, that's the battle that we are talking about here, the same battle, the battle of life where we are assailed by doubts, we wonder okay the scriptures and all and the teachings are they really true, does it really work? Is it relevant to our modern lifestyle? You know, these are, these are really relevant questions. And these are the questions that all seekers ask. I can only say, it works. You need a certain amount of trust. You need to be willing to experiment with this system. And... Be willing to hang in there, stay in there, sustain it for a longer period of time. Don't give up too early, don't give up too quick. You need, of course, some guidance. Radhika Ji, 
Sriram has put a question in the chat box. Yes, I have already answered it. Thank you. That was. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I, I didn't want. I didn't want to see because I asked and I saw his question and then I realized he had put it before I asked. Yeah. That's all. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So um, we can go to verses five to nine. Upon attaining this, seers become content in their wisdom, established in Atman, free from attachment and desire, and fully at peace. Upon attaining the all-pervading consciousness, the realized souls enter the realm of Brahman. Those who attain this simple, precise wisdom expound, sorry, the final, precise wisdom expounded in Vedanta and who, by following the path of renunciation, have purified their minds, attain freedom from all bondage, and after casting off the body, go to the realm of Brahman, the realm of highest immortality. At the time of liberation, all the 15 constituents of the body five gross elements, five senses and five pranas return to their sources. The senses subside in their origins. All previous karmas, intellectual knowledge and the individual soul all become one with the absolute Brahman. Just as the flowing rivers give up their names and forms and merge into the ocean, so does the realized soul disidentify itself from all names and forms and attain the highest self-illuminated Purusha. One who knows Brahman really becomes Brahman and in his lineage no one remains ignorant of Brahman. He goes beyond all sorrow and vice and enters freedom from all the knots at the cave of the heart and thus becomes immortal. So, some very, very profound verses here. We talk about seers here. Seers or sages, seers, one who have seen, seen the truth. They are not the ones who have read the truth. We are not talking about readers here. <laughs> we are talking about seers. They have seen the truth. And that follows from the practice, the system, systematic approach. And then you see the reality, the higher reality. You are self-realized. And when that happens, you're just content in wisdom. You're free from all these attachments. You know, your mind is not running all over the place. Desires seem to subside or just seem to dissolve. And there's a certain rest. You rest in this. Yoga Sutras refers to resting in the self. It's a beautiful, very beautiful image. You just rest in the self. It's a moment of absolute peace. The word ashram comes from there as well. Ashram is where you get shelter, where you can rest. So this idea of rest, resting is in a very positive sense. When there is nothing more to be done, there are no more questions to be asked. And there's a sense of resting. And such souls enter the realm of Brahman by following the path of renunciation. Once again, to clarify here, renunciation is not the same as Tyaga. Tyaga, you physically renounce the worldly objects. But here we are not talking about that Tiaga, but renunciation through vairagya, param vairagya. 
That is, you may enjoy these objects, but you are not attached to them anymore. You are not bound to these objects anymore. And such a one eventually goes to the realm of Brahman after casting of his body. Then all the samskaras have been played out. The mind is purified and all samskaras have been played out. Then you leave your body consciously. Most of us die unconsciously, unconscious death. And when I say unconscious here, I do not mean you die. I don't refer to somebody who's dying unconsciously in his sleep. You may be apparently awake uh, at that point of time, but still the mind shuts down and you're not conscious. If you see in this very moment, just become aware of yourself. In this very moment, look around. As you're listening to me speaking, and you suddenly become aware of so many things around you. But just a minute ago, you were not aware of these things. So our awareness can expand suddenly. During meditation, during deep meditation, awareness expands. During death, generally, consciousness contracts. You don't, you're not aware of it because of the fear of death. The senses are shutting down, everything is shutting down, and death is generally unconscious. But a seer, a one who has practiced vairagya, abhyasa and vairagya, so tapa and vairagya, the one who has practiced vairagya, he can sustain that vairagya even during the process of separation that we call death. The separation is when the jivatman or the, the atman separates from the body from the rest of the body. For a seer, all the, the samskaras have already been lived out, worked out, and the body is dropped and the Atman becomes one with the Paramatman. It expands, so to say, it becomes universal, you know, the individual soul or the individual Atman expands to the universal self. It's a sort of awareness expanding. It's the same process. The body is dropped, left behind. This is the process of separation. It's called death. The separation is not physically painful. It is for those who have not learned Vairagya, that process is painful, but not physically painful. It's painful because of the attachment. Attachment to the body, attachment to emotions, different, different aspects. But the separation is not physically painful. And when that separation takes place, if you are a seer, you just drop the body, effortlessly drop, and the Atman, the individual soul, sorry, individual self, expands to universal consciousness, becomes one with Brahman. Just like when a river enters into the ocean, it loses its individual identity, it becomes one with the ocean. You cannot separate the river from the ocean anymore. They become one. What happens to the one who, who attains that? In his lineage, no one remains ignorant of Brahman. By lineage here is not the biological lineage meant but 
those who have been trained by such a seer and working together in the sense of transforming, practicing, being guided by such a, such a seer, an adept, is quite different from being guided by somebody who has read books. If you go to somebody who has only read books or, or done some 200-hour yoga teacher's training program, the result is going to be quite different. If you go to somebody who has spent hours in meditation, has had direct experience, is an adept, you are going to get very different kind of instructions, very different kind of responses to questions. It's based on experience. A person who has only read books and and then has attended some courses cannot give you this kind of guidance. So those who wish to be freed from suffering should also look for teachers or be in a lineage that is based on experience and not that is based on intellectual knowledge. Does that make some sense? I hope that was useful. It's not a very easy uh, word. They're not easy, these verses. They're very profound and requires time to contemplate on them. Any questions, any comments, observations? Before I continue with the last two verses, I would like to make a couple of announcements. One is that uh, a couple of you wrote to me asking me um, if the meetings had been continuing and what happened. It was because I sent, didn't send out invites the last couple of sessions. And we have our sessions regularly every Friday and I don't always send out invites because Generally, in the beginning of the new topic, I do that. But once, you know, people have been settled in to a, a new topic or a new subject, then I know there will be no more new people joining in. And those who are regular will attend. So don't always expect um, invites. We have them every Friday at the same time, and when there are some changes, I will inform you. I always inform you always in advance in these meetings as well as in the Facebook group that we have. Since this uh, topic of the Munda Upanishad ends here today, we will complete these last two verses. From next week, we will be doing the essential yoga sutras. We are not covering the entire yoga sutra because that is quite difficult, uh, not generally very practical. And to do the entire yoga sutra tends generally to become a little bit more complicated. And so we will have about three or four sessions to cover the most important sutras. 
And the final announcement that I wanted to make was that we will continue these meetings until the end of August. The months of September, October, November and December, we will not be having meetings. I am taking a sabbatical to complete the complete my second book, which is uh, based, uh, it's a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. And so I'm taking these four months off to complete this, among other things, of course. So September to December, there will be no meetings, no online meetings. Okay. So those were the announcements. We come back to the verses and Nikolaj asks, what are the knots at the cave of the heart? There are three basic knots. They are called granthis. It's called a granthi and not a granti. <laughs> Some people tend to pronounce it granti and granti sounds cute but it's actually a granthi and that means a knot but it also means doubt, you know, a doubt or a knot that is very difficult to untie or to cut through. What it essentially is, is a blockage in the pranic energy. I dare say the word kundalini. <laughs> always gets twisted so it's a blockage where the energy is is not allowing you to free yourself from this bondage of the karma that you have it's a very deep ancient vasanas samskaras which which are holding you to this, in this cycle and keeping you in this material form, coming back again and again to be embodied and um, to be free from all these knots in the knot of the, the cave of the heart is one of the three. And one goes goes through, breaks through all three, of course, but uh, this one is mentioned here. Special mention here. That's where the Jeev Atman resides, in the cave of the heart. Those who meditate will eventually, sooner or later, encounter these knots, these granthis. If you would ask this question to somebody who is um, reading books, you know, they like to read books on Kundalini and stuff, they will give you some intellectual answer. To it and if you ask what how does this manifest there's not no, they are not able to answer this because they don't really meditate they they have no experience of these but these knots manifest the form of very very strong emotions which will confront you also during deep meditation very powerful very very powerful I mentioned briefly, I think it was last time, the, the power of the unconscious mind. Yes, that's very powerful. So we come to the very last verses, the last two verses. I'm reading verses 10 and 11. As is said in the mantra, this knowledge of Brahman should be imparted only to those who are sincere, studious, Inclined towards Brahman, self-discipline, and who are dedicated to one seer, and who has taken a vow 
of carrying fire on their heads according to the rules. The seer Angiras explained truth in ancient times. A person who has fulfilled his vows may study this Upanishad. Homage to the great sages. Homage to the great sages. So, why are we studying this Upanishad? Are you qualified to study this Upanishad? Have you taken a vow of carrying fire on your head? While we may talk about this Upanishad here in a more public manner, all the same, the transfer of knowledge that takes place between the teacher and the student is sacred, is very special. And only those students who have taken that vow of carrying fire on their heads will understand what is being taught here. Those who have taken the vow of carrying fire on their heads are those who have begun to gain access to the Guru Chakra. And they want to purify themselves. They are ready for that. This is the Tantric path. The Vedic path is performing duties, rituals and these aspects. Yogic Tantric path is direct knowledge. And those who are ready for that path and have started to do that, getting self-knowledge, only they will understand the true significance of these words. The others will only under understand these words at an intellectual level, which is why Some traditions make a great deal about the secrecy, but I say that we can share these scriptures. It will not make any difference because the real secret is the practice. When you do the practice, only then do you get a direct understanding of what is spoken about here. All this is ultimately Sandhya Bhasha. It is all expressed in a certain way, in a mystical manner, metaphors, analogies, symbols. And the true understanding of this can only happen when you experience it. For example, the knots at the cave of the heart. I gave an answer. I don't know if that answer really helped anybody. But when you experience that cave, uh, knot at the cave of the heart yourself, you experience the power of that knot and what it does to you, how it blocks you from your development. And then you will know what the knot of the cave of the heart means. So in our tradition, we say, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam. Don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. All the Scriptures are there in books, internet, everywhere. They are all available in different languages. There is no secret there. What is it that we don't impart? What we cannot impart are these kind of experiences, direct experiences, which can only happen when one studies a self-disciplined practicing with dedication to one lineage, one adept, with that sincerity, 
wanting to purify oneself. Carrying the fire on the head is burning the samskaras in the inner fire, that inner fire that is somehow symbolized or as if it's in, in the head. Some of you may or may not be aware, you know that it is forbidden to show the Prophet Mama in any form, right? Like a photo or a picture. One cannot show the photo or a, a, rep, a representation of the Prophet Muhammad. There's only one way one can show that. In pictures of stories about Muhammad when he goes to the, the mountain, you know, and when he's meditating, sometimes in art, they represent Muhammad instead of his head, there is fire. Show fire, his head is on fire. So basically, there's no head, but there's fire. And that's where the idea comes from. It's the same idea, the idea of purifying all these impurities in the mind and the samskaras are being burnt away. So, dedicated to one adept, one tradition, one teacher, with self-discipline, when you're willing to work, then these things will be imparted to you. They will be revealed. The Upanishads are revelations, Shruti. They are revealed. So the secret is not something to be revealed in books. It is revealed to you through direct experience. I can tell you symbolically what it means to carry a fire on the head. I can tell you, yes, that is why Muhammad is represented with, with his head, you know, a fire instead of uh, his physical head. But when you have the direct experience of the Guru Chakra, then you will understand what this means, direct experience. And such a person really is qualified to study the Supanishad. Everybody else is merely reading it. So there is no imminent danger of revealing any deep secrets. The secrets are all safe as long as you don't practice, no secrets will be revealed to you. Or shall I put it this way, no secrets will be revealed unto you. Well, that was the end of this Beautiful Mundak Upanishad, one of the finest, one of the most profound of all Upanishads, one of the highest Upanishads or texts of our tradition, which is a practical tradition based on yoga sadhana. We have our own systematic approach and the student is led step by step in the inner process towards purification and is not a process, um, you know, which you can just sort of check off on your box, uh, yes, done, done, done. It's a really deep, ongoing process. And the, 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 the funny part about this is that, in fact, you don't know where you're really going. You don't know where this is going to lead. You just have an assurance that it's going to be wonderful. And that is indeed very true. It's very beautiful, wonderful process. And, and the experiences that one goes through on this path as well. Would anybody like to add something? Question, comments? Yeah. Uh, hello? Yes. 
Uh, yeah, Radhika ji, I wanted to ask one thing. You uh, talked about Vasana and Samskara. What is Vasana? Vasanas are basically the same as Samskaras. Um, they are only differences. Samskaras are impressions which may be from this lifetime, a couple of lifetimes. But samskar, uh, but but vasanas are very very ancient impressions. They are so far that they they have they are, they are diffuse. So one says that this body and what you are going through now is the result of the samskaras of the last two lifetimes. So whatever you are now is the product of the last two lifetimes. Whatever you have coming up in your life. The body you have, the kind of family you are born into, the opportunities you have, you know, the, the skills, the qualities, all these things are a result of last two lifetimes. So your next lifetime, samskaras will be depending on what you have done in this lifetime and the last lifetime. Right? You understood that? Yeah. Yes, but okay. vasanas are very, very ancient. They could be vasanas of a time when you were an animal. They're animal vasanas. Oh, okay. Yes, they are vasanas yeah. of a time when you were perhaps a tree. <laughs> yeah. And it may happen then during deeper meditation that some of these vasanas also come forward. Kind of scary, but yes, they can come forward. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and they have okay, a, thank you. Yes, and they have a deeper influence on our lives, not an immediate impact like the samskaras from the last two lifetimes, as well as the ones you have created in this life. They have a much deeper influence. You know, there are certain things, for example, fears that come from there. It's very diffuse. So, okay, it also comes from like primitive fountains? Yes, yes. Some of the primitive fountains are related very much to vasanas. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good. So, <clears throat> that was a good um, question, a nice little clarification of the two, which is perhaps at some point maybe only theoretical but for those who are meditating it's just just nice to know it's a nice piece of information okay so that was a nice um, session of the mundaka upanishad which we end here and as i said next time we will start the essential yoga sutras and I hope everybody has a nice weekend. Bye-bye, everyone.